Good morning. Um, <clears throat> we're here to s discuss uh, solving for per first party data. And I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves to you before we get started. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Evan Hanlon. I'm president for M Platform in the US. Um, so I oversee uh, both the addressable media teams as well as the data and technology teams uh, for Group M across our different agencies uh, for the United States. Hi, I'm Dylan Lockett with iProspect. I'm the VP and head of display, which is a really uh, inaccurate title. It really encompasses <laughs> uh, you know, anything programmatic, audio, video, as well as display and native. Hi, I'm Libby Sneed. I am the Director of Marketing at Avo, which is a relatively new title for me. I originally ran the email team, or the B2B email team at Avo, and now am in charge of the content, email, events, and social team at Avo. Great. So um, we know that normalizing data is not an easy thing to do. What are the biggest challenges in terms of working with clients? Evan, you want to start off? Sure. I think one of the, the, the biggest challenges in terms of, of tackling a lot of this uh, frequently is sort of the state of technology plans um, for a lot of clients. I think we're at sort of this, um, this juncture in which there was a lot of interest, I think, originally in looking for the best point solution in a lot of different places. Um, and that worked for a while. But as more and more of those platforms have been hoovered up by sort of larger clouds or um, have sort of gone away or have expanded in terms of, uh, of what their own capabilities are or what their aspirations are within the, the, the marketplace, integration has become a lot harder. Um, so you have the, the sort of challenge of trying to get both of uh, your partners sort of to play with each other and sort of integrate and work towards a common technology plan. Um, but then the other challenge is that the sort of proliferation of data points and data sets and domains that you're interested in um, are really challenging as well. And so increasingly where we see a lot of challenges is in with clients, for example, trying to normalize between, you know, really small kind of top down um, traditional data sets, like what they do with panel work and what they've th thought about from a, uh, a kind of research perspective with the sort of big data plans that they have in terms of what they're doing within DMPs and CRM and now increasingly within, um, you know, set-top box data sets that they're getting from uh, the television space along the way. So the fact that you've got to deal with not only lots of different systems, but lots of different domains and lots of different priorities internally um, creates a, a huge challenge in trying to actually uh, make all that usable and workable, and, and most importantly, make it usable and workable in a, in a fast way. Um, it's great if you can do this, but if it takes you six months, mm -hmm. right, you've lost that opportunity to move very quickly and actually influence what you're doing in the marketplace uh, that day. Interesting. I know we talked about this earlier um, together, and uh, Libby, you followed up with um, a comment on organizing marketing teams around a data-centric approach. Can you um, elaborate on that? Sure. So as I mentioned, I came into my current position through the email org, and my background is actually email marketing. Um, and data is like the lifeblood of email marketing. I don't know how many of you have spent a lot of time in that world, but every decision we made, every program we put forth was based on what were our consumers or users doing and how could we prompt them with the right email at the right time. Um, in my previous role at Classmates, where I ran the email team, we built a whole email engine around this methodology of like knowing who our users were, what they were doing, and how could we move them along in their journey with us. And at Avo, it's similar. We're trying to understand what our consumers need. I don't know how many of you know who Avo is or what we do, but we are trying to make legal easier. And that's for both consumers connecting them with attorneys when they need them, or attorneys helping them grow their practice. And so one of the big things we like to look at is what do our consumers need and how do we front load our data sets with that information? So asking the right questions when they join to then be able to use that information downstream so that we're making sure that we're using that in all of the marketing that we do. And so this goes across from our email team, which I do have a um, relatively robust email team with great experience. And so and then feeding that into our content team, our social team, and making sure that we're being consistent in our messaging based on that data. Excellent. Dylan, um, you talked about structuring based on a client's needs and uh, internal makeup uh, being a focal point for your uh, company. Can you uh, give us some more details on that? 
Sure. Uh, so, I mean, we've just in talking already, we've talked a lot about how clients have different levels of, of data integration and the way that they're staffing for those uh, solutions really vary from client to client. So I think you know, typically you see uh, sometimes data gets very isolated in its application where, you know, you have a channel team just kind of marching in one particular direction and they're activating on kind of a singular point of identity or or uh, uh, utilization, but there's nothing that's really being done to kind of stitch that story together across all channels and ultimately like tie that back to a tangible business result instead of just a media KPI, right? Um, so one thing that we like to do is, is really try to take a step back and bring in like our strategy teams and make sure that we are looking at it beyond just purely from the lens of a single channel and, and driving those results. Uh, and asking the questions of like, okay, how are we going to activate on this data to achieve not just what the client wants to you know, hit from a media plan and, and results perspective, but tie it back to their business goals and understand you know, uh, the conversation earlier around correlation and causation, like that's great. Like, how can we have a truly like, causative approach to the way that we are evaluating that and answering those types of questions? I think that what the interesting point that you made there, which I think is great, that the, the challenge of the single point of activation, and I think like Libby's got a kind of modern progressive viewpoint of a, a marketing organization where you've got that purview across everything. I feel a lot of the times when we work with clients, that stuff has been siloed for so long and has been built in these sort of independent sort of ways. Being able to bring all that back between you know the research team, the media activation team sometimes would sit between three or four different teams and then in between different brands within large clients and then that come with their own philosophies about how to do those things as well like that's the sort of the really big challenge of being able to bring that back and, and make it accessible to everybody within a within a big organization so what are some of the pitfalls involved there and how do you deal with those yeah you mentioned the stitching together of data which is a term my team is probably chuckling as they're watching this right now because we use that constantly um, and one of the big pitfalls that I've seen, not only, I think just in general over the course of my career, is trying to do too much at once and really needing to start with knowing what your kind of base level data set is that is most crucial to helping you move forward towards your KPIs or OKRs and then building from there. So get really stable and have like a lot of confidence in that level and then starting to add more layers on. Because one of the things that I found over my career is the thing that you think might be really important, it might not actually be. So once you dive into the data, building that foundation, watching how things change and perform, and then being able to add, okay, let's add this new layer on. And then it's not reinventing, or I think we were talking about building the Titanic, you're building a rowboat and then maybe adding a sail. Um, and so you're not kind of doing it all at once, taking it step by step. I think, you know, there's just a tack onto that, like there's a tendency to kind of lose the forest for the trees, so to speak, where you can look at all of this vast data and you're thinking about this you know, media campaign that you want to put in market and you're like, well, we want to do this, we want to do this, we want to measure towards this, uh, you know, we've got to make sure this audience segment is included. Let's have 17 different creative variants and test all these different messages. And you can sit there forever in a planning stage and then the end of the year is up and you never actually like got a really powerful campaign into market. So I think you, know, you have to have, uh, I guess, kind of uh, an okayness or, or uh, you know, a willingness to accept like a degree of ambiguity as you go into market and realize that you're going to figure these things out as you go and start tacking onto it, but you're not gonna be able to solve all of the world's problems on the first day. Yeah, I think that there's, I think what you sort of outlined is, is the biggest thing that we see where the perfect frequently is the enemy of the good, right? There's the, this desire of like, well, I want to do this thing and this is what my sort of North Star is. And then there's a feeling and an insistence which instead of making iterative or step-by-step -step progress towards that goal, we've got to get the silver bullet that solves that right away. When in reality, if you make five, 10% improvement every six months to a year, eventually you're going to be in a totally transformative spot. It's also got this sort of, um, weird, ironic kind of flip side to it as well, which is that I think that there's also a desire and sometimes a desperation in to sort of accomplish those transformations, to buy into, um, you know, beliefs and capabilities and trends that don't ultimately exist today, right? Like the whole idea of sort of people-based marketing, right, which is sort of like swept through in this idea that if I know everything about this one person, right, I can make them do anything that I want to. 
at the end of the day, like we still live in a platform-based world in which you know there's a, a sort of fragmented identity space. You still you know you still have to trade off of cookies. You still have to trade off of device IDs, right? You still have to deal with all of that stitching work. So, as I think glamorous as we would like a lot of this to be, like a ton of it is still just like enormous amounts of grunt work mm -hmm. that's like incredibly unsexy and like takes a really long time. Um, and that's I think the, the the key piece, which is there is no silver bullet for any of those pieces yet, and we kind of have to you know do it from the ground up. And I think when you take that approach, like you said, six, 12 months down the road, you're all of a sudden in a place of how did we even get here? Look at all these great things we've done. But when you're taking the step by step, it's not the quantum leaps. It's more of these like baby steps along the way where you're just, you're trying little things out. And the nice thing about doing it that way is you're able to really understand the impact and the performance because you don't have so many outside influences. It's more of the, oh, we tried this thing. It worked, we did a quick test, now we're gonna add on to it, and we have a confidence in the first step, and then you keep building and building and building, and then six, 12 months down the road, you're looking at your campaigns, you're looking at your programs, and it's vastly different, and you don't realize how quickly you actually got there. Okay, so on that, where does the conflict planning come in? So when you say conflict planning, could you just clarify a little bit? Well, there's a lot of expectation top down on what you what you want the got data it, to it. tell you. So ultimately Got it. I see what you're saying. How, yeah. How, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, no, I, so yeah, I think that that is a, a really big challenge and Libby, I think you kind of touched on it before where before we had one way of doing things for a really long time. And a lot of those still work and are really valid. Like I'm certainly not sort of throwing them all out. But there were a lot more sort of top-down research-based approaches mm -hmm. that when you switch to a world in which you're dealing with sort of bottom-up data sets and you're sort of interrogating it for information and insight, not only is it a sort of different skill set, um, but it oftentimes yields very different results. And it's not that they can't exist together, but that they serve very different purposes mm -hmm. in terms of people that you want to reach versus maybe people who are ultimately responding to you. Um, and I think that the, the big piece about, and, and, and I think that it is challenging for a lot of organizations because when you've sort of, you know, been very successful for in sometimes decades of building brands around um, sort of what are, are these kind of beliefs and known knowns that you thought you've had before, to have something come along and tell you, well, actually, the, the, your next opportunity looks completely different and you have to think about this in a totally different way, you know, and you have to plan about this differently, you have to create a whole different set of creative to actually impact this, and oh, by the way, it's gonna be really hard and it's not gonna yield the same ROI that you had before, like, that's a really difficult, I think, conversation to have internally. Yeah. But I, I think that increasingly what you're having now is sort of a new generation of kind of researchers and um, consumer insights teams, et cetera, um, who are used to these kind of big data practices who are, who, who are, you know, kind of wrapping their heads around that and increasingly starting to synthesize that with what some of these top-down approaches are as well. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really hard, and I think a lot of times it can be very difficult when you're dealing with, you know, CMO organizations and sort of marketing leads who are saying, well, hey, you came along and you told me this one thing for all this time, and now you're saying you were wrong the whole time? It's not that you were wrong, it's the world changed, right. and also the way that we communicate and how form ultimately follows function changes as well. So I think that is another, you know, kind of very deliberate, um, you know, kind of uh, a, a change management process that you have to deal with that's just as important as sort of technology plans and sort of planning and implementation right. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think like going into any sort of new campaign or, or engagement or especially like when a dramatic shift in strategy is undergone, um, defining a measurement framework up front is really, really important. And that can be one of those places where you can spend quite a bit of time as you're trying to map out like exactly how you're going to measure the success of the campaign. But at the end of the day, like we have so much data available to us, like you can kind of make it tell whatever story you want. Um, and so you need to set expectations up front around like here's what we're going to go after and this is going to be our primary source of truth. And then everything else from that, like those are those additional insights that we can pull in and you know, kind of iterate like how we are approaching measurement in the future because we learned a little bit more here and we learned a little bit more here. Um, but you, ju you just can't go in blindly or, or rely on kind of like outdated metrics or what you've always done. Like you have to continue like challenging exactly how you are going to measure to make sure that you're thinking about it from kind of that big picture perspective and, and not just looking at you know, media KPIs. Yeah, and I think the expectations piece is key, knowing what you're trying to go after and making sure you broadly and clearly communicate with each major change where you're going and what you're doing and why you're doing it. I've also found that it's really important to identify what you're not 
going to do, what data you're not going to worry about, or what KPI isn't important, so that it's people don't start to ask about that. They understand that that's not something you're looking towards. Um, so it's just as important to say what you are going to cover as what you're not going to cover. And then people's expectations are very clear, and they don't um, maybe go down a rabbit hole that you don't want to with a particular campaign. Yeah, I think that's that's so important. And, and to your point, you know, like there's so much data that at some point it starts to obfuscate what you're actually trying to do. And like at the end of the day, you know, when like we're in the business of helping our brands grow that we work with and increase their profitability and find more profitable consumers. And while there's a lot of interesting new modern techniques to do that, like it's it's there's not a sort of like brand new thing that no one ever thought about that we've just invented, right? Like a lot of this stuff is based in in sort of time old kind of uh, uh, principles, and on top of that, with all the data that we have, at the end of the day, right? You look at am I selling more stuff? Is my share price going up? Is my profitability going up? like those are the big metrics that kind of matter. And if you attenuate yourself around that, as opposed to you know a kind of long list of things sometimes that are way too technical for people to understand what to ultimately do with them, I think you're going to be in a better spot. Yeah, I think helping break down the, the technical pieces and putting things into more layperson's terms, if you will, goes a long way too, so that people don't just gloss over their eyes, start to think about something else you can tell, um, and helping them understand like what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it, and how this ultimately helps your consumers, particularly for us or our attorneys. Yeah. And it becomes a thing that like a lot of companies can start to hide behind, right? You know, when you look at like a lot of folks who are increasingly now, it's less about completeness of data and more about transparency into calculation and algorithms. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of folks will come along and they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, we've got a billion different data points that we consider within the models. But the sort of variable selection process means that only 50 to 100 are ever gonna matter. So like there's this sort of, you know, ability to hide behind, I think a lot of times the kind of marketing component of it that obfuscates like, what's valuable, where you should actually focus your time on versus, you know, what sounds, you know, phenomenal. I think the whole kind of, you know, like the nonsense around artificial intelligence when at the end of the day, it's like machine learning that we've been doing for 40 years, you know, just in like slightly more powerful computers, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, right, it's about how you apply it. It's about, you know, that kind of human intelligence and ability to understand what's actually being communicated to you that becomes a lot more important. Yeah, and being able to take you know, all of those like kind of in the weeds details and then tease out like exactly what a CMO should know when they're reviewing their media performance, like from their, you know, direct reports and our, the teams that we're working with. Like that's where you have to have like kind of this translation ability where you can uh, actually like kind of move past just the baseline metrics or all of the talk around algorithms or how many data points go, go into your model and say like, okay, here's what you need to know about how we're leveling up the way that we're buying media and here's how it's gonna grow our brand. Uh, and I think that is kind of something that is uh, becoming more and more prominent as we work with our clients today. Like they need to know like, how do I make this relevant for my CMO or my leadership team? Okay, well, I can understand that trying to get through to the CMO and the marketing people must be pretty darn hard because I come from covering those kinds of uh, <laughs> stories. And I just wonder, do you have any uh, success stories you can share in some way on how uh, a, maybe a particular brand, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about that, um, but it, uh, maybe a, an industry that, that's particularly open to hearing what you have to say? Sure, so I, I think one example that comes to mind for us, we worked with a, a large fashion retailer, and we, we really you know, kind of took a step back from the way that we had planned their media typically and got organizational buy-in just to kind of throw things at the wall and, and really see what the data told us and use that to inform our campaign planning. And yes, we're gonna be in brand search, and yes, we're gonna do remarketing, but we're also gonna try some other things, like depending on what you know, the data actually tells us. And so we you know, looked at their target audience, we were able to tease out some really unique insights I think that otherwise we wouldn't have really been exposed to about that audience's consumption of digital audio, uh, where they typically engage with video and the platform. And we came to market with a whole bunch of different tactics and strategies that normally we wouldn't have employed, uh, and the brand was generally a little uncomfortable with it. But because we'd kind of defined that process up front and said, we are going to try this, here's how we are going to measure it, and here is how we are going to be data-led, you know, we were kind of able to manage expectations through that process. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, like, 
the results were great, the brand grew, everybody was happy with performance, all the things that you would expect me to say on a stage like this. But <laughs> you know, I, I think it kind of speaks to that process of like being able to define exactly what you're going to measure and how you are going to evaluate this and iterate this throughout uh, and how that can ultimately be successful within a, a large marketing organization. Yeah, I think that one of the most interesting clients that you know I've, I've had the chance to work with uh, is one of our auto clients who I, has had that sort of mentality of not worrying about whether what they did yesterday was sort of right or wrong, but adapting to how things have ultimately changed. Um, and so over the course of the years, we worked a lot with them around when sort of kind of data management platform capability was sort of first emerging to be able to use that to apply what they were doing to at that time, which was still a very sort of ad network, you know, dominated buying. Um, and we're able to introduce this sort of very kind of, you know, rigorous kind of like deathmatch like, um, you know, optimization scheme um, to help them extract more value from that. And then as programmatic got more, as programmatic was became more prevalent, um, more usable, worked its way further up the, the, the sort of ad server stack, um, they made a, a shift very quickly from being much more sort of performance and network driven to being much more audience driven, um, sort of overnight, right? And it was a really painful kind of process for them because they essentially were going from a realm in which they had a ton of benchmarks, a really good understanding, a really finely tuned system, to one that was like definitely gonna break on day two um, because it was brand new. And also, it wasn't, they weren't gonna be able to easily compare what they were doing from the day before. Um, but sort of their willingness to kind of jump in meant that sort of overnight, they saw 40% you know, reduction in what their sort of clearing prices were because they were able to take advantage um, of a biddable marketplace. You know? And so things like that, and, and they didn't sort of sit, go back and say, well, you know, what were we doing for all these years? They were saying, okay, well, what can we do next? And so each year they kind of added a sort of new piece to it. The following year from there was looking at sort of re-examining how they work with their ad server and their attribution provider so they could actually make it actionable, make it real, and actually start to bill off of what those numbers were. So this sort of like very deliberate progression, you know, in terms of thinking not only about how they buy, but what their technology plan was, um, and what were they really trying to answer for. Um, you know, one of the big ones also was connecting sort of fast-moving online leading indicators with what they were doing from an offline sales perspective. By being really pointed about that, it helped them identify the data sets that actually mattered to them, and also ignore the ones that, you know, were, were good and useful and big and might actually be more cheaper and more easy to use, uh, but might not have gotten them to the answer as quickly as they ultimately wanted to. Interesting. Uh, maybe we can open this up to questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes? Hi, uh, my name is Alex Jorgen. I'm from a company called Data Wallet. We're a, we're a personal data management platform. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the panel. Question going off what Evan was saying, and I guess for all of you, you talk a lot about how there's disparate personas, you can't link up data. How interesting to you would it be if individuals could sort of, would get in in the game somehow and could just give you access to insights about their Facebook, Google data, et cetera, data and sort of unified in one place and then you get complete personas behind these walled gardens that everyone is complaining about? I'll go. Um, <laughs> So th there's two things. So there's first, I think that there's like a societal piece of this, which you didn't ask about, but I'm gonna answer anyways, um, <laughs> which is that like, it's like there's, there's, there's an inflection point that's coming, right? Which is that like we've seen it in Europe with GDPR and it's coming to the United States, right? It's already here in California. So, and I think that like in general, we haven't been the best stewards and we haven't been as transparent and clear as possible to consumers and people in terms of what the value exchange is from there. So I think that there's a component of what you're sort of describing and, and I know what, what you guys do where it is really valuable because I think it makes it a lot clearer and more understandable and legible uh, to consumers, um, which will make it better, I think, in the longer term. The, the second part, was the kind of questions you actually asked, um, is that I think it is very valuable. I think that increasingly, though, to me, that value happens further up the chain and happens directly with clients like Libby, et cetera, because at the end of the day, you know, in a biddable, you know, uh, I come from Group M, right? Like, our whole thing was like, we buy the most media, right? And so we get the best prices. That doesn't matter in a biddable world. And so what matters is how much you know. And, and at the end of the day, the only thing that you know, brands have over anybody else are their own consumers and their own view of them and their relationship to their brands and to their products. And so uh, increasingly, I think uh, we're, uh, we think a lot about, okay, how does this data work within a DSP context, within a media buying context, et cetera? 
to me, it, it's a lot more about how do I further enrich the consumer data assets that my brands have before we even get to the media world, right? And sort of move further upstream. So short answer is, I think it's tremendously valuable and I think it's happening in systems that in a lot of cases are a lot more old fashioned than what we're super, you know, super used to. I think it happens with the email lists more so than within the DMP. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an incredibly valuable and useful piece for the future. I come back to knowing what our consumers and our users actually are telling us they need, how we connect with them, and the information that they provide to us to help enrich their experience that they're having. So if they're coming to us because they have a legal concern, making sure that we're able to use the information they provide to us to connect them with the right attorney who can help them. So for me, it's more about what information are they giving to us because that's what's telling us what they need from our product. Yeah, and I, you know, I think everything so far has been very well said. And there's uh, really, like, just to tack on a little bit, I think it's really important to be able to kind of discern the signal from the noise when it comes to consumer data points, right? Like, there are 900 billion attributes that you could pull in about you know, any of your consumers, but which of the ones are actually relevant to what they're looking for from an experience perspective today? Um, you know, you can learn all sorts of different things about someone, but that doesn't mean that it's actually going to increase your ability to market to them. Um, and I, I think we are kind of entering into this age where now uh, there's this obsession with collecting as much data as possible and, and we're you know, spending billions of dollars on data transfer and everything else. It's like, okay, what do we actually need to know in order to market to this consumer? Uh, so you have to keep kind of a, a focus on that throughout. Hey, Jeremy here from Datarama. Um, curious, uh, you talked about the inflection point that was coming. Uh, I'm not sure I'm so convinced that it's coming. I, I think uh, users like free uh, in terms of user experience, and therefore a lot of people are like, take the data, do whatever you want with it. Um, but I'm curious, uh, kind of in relation to that, uh, Amazon's coming with their kind of DSP offering, and everybody's kind of f afraid of pumping in their first-party data for the reasons that you know Facebook is is, is in the news now. Um, how do you guys think about uh, that from an Amazon perspective? Uh, Roku's starting to think about the same things. Like, how do you guys think about uh, advertisers' uh, reluctance to to pump first-party data into these platforms? Well, actually, Libby, I'm, I'd be curious to hear from you because you are an advertiser. I'm going to let you guys take this one. <laughs> Um, I, so I actually believe that that is starting, that issue is starting to, it, to go away. I think that people are, are, well, first off, I think people are recognizing that like the Amazon and Google data assets, like at the end of the day, dwarf in value from an economic perspective and in terms of knowledge perspective, pretty much anything else that there is out there. I think that also like the direction that we're going right now is a world in which, you know, we're going to end up with. I think, and I, I'm probably wrong on the number, but like seven to 10, you know, walled gardens. And, you know, some folks at AT&T, for example, have started to call them community gardens, which I, I like a lot. Um, <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, it, what's the future, and, and you've seen this with Google's Ads Data Hub, right, in which they're actually doing a phenomenal job of letting you gain access to data that you never would have been able to before. Now, the trade-off is you can't take it out, right? You have to use it within their platform. But them giving you control over how to do the math, how to do the calculation, how to join it up, interact with those super granular data sets that they ultimately have is like a huge step change, one that you would have never expected even a year or two ago. So I think that as you see sort of these, the big providers take a step towards that of these kind of clean room environments to give you access to that data, you're going to see brands recognize that that is a valuable sort of exchange for bringing their data into um, those platforms as well. I think it also means that, again, brand first party data becomes really important because it becomes a tuning fork between these different platforms. It becomes the commonality where even though I can't directly link up what's going on in Facebook, what's going on in Google, what's going on in Amazon, I at least know that I've started from that same source of truth and I can understand what the discrepancies are between them and do something kind of interesting. So weirdly, again, we're like sort of everything old is new again. We're kind of going back to a world where we had, you know, four broadcast networks and then maybe a couple dozen cable networks that mattered again, which means that that consistent view becomes more important. And again, I think that issue starts to go away over time as folks sort of recognize that they can get a lot more value if they ultimately you know, are a little bit more open and more free about it. And we talked earlier about like how organizationally you know, uh, brands are kind of aligning themselves in order to activate on data and things like that. And I think that where I've seen some of our clients be most successful and, and kind of jump into that water 
is when they have uh, you know a, a pretty well matrixed data team that involves you know, people from the legal and compliance organization. Like I think that that's a, a big part of it and, and have those folks that are, folks, I'm from Texas, sorry, um, <laughs> have those folks that are you know, actually able to speak the language and translate that back uh, to the rest of the legal team so that they can speak to like, okay, here is how we are uh, licensing our data, here are the points at which we are exposed, and ultimately like here's what we stand to gain from doing so. Uh, I think that, that makes the conversation a little bit easier from the brand side because you're not relying so much on like a brand new translation. If you already have somebody from those teams that is kind of well versed in the space and understands what's going on. I actually, I'm not going to let my good friend Libby get off the hook when it comes to data. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're dealing, I mean, you're, Avo is dealing potentially with uh, sensitive data even from people who are pinging your site, right? I mean, if I'm, if I'm looking for a lawyer and I'm coming to your site, that's telling somebody something about me. So I'm, I'm just curious about, my question is, what is, what is your approach to uh, privacy and security? And how, do you com how are you communicating with your users about oh, it? Oh, that's a great question. I actually talked with Esther, who's our attorney, um, about this very question <laughs> just a, like 48 hours ago. Um, and it's, it's one of those things about you know, clearly letting your, your users know what data, you know, the questions you're asking, what you're going to do with the data, and that using that data to inform the decisions that you're making. So being very clear and upfront about it, um, I think is, is a huge part. And to what you guys were talking about as well, um, I think there's an element of, of these teams and being very tapped into our data team, our data engineers, our data scientists, our lawyers, our, um, our marketing team, having this kind of cross-functional group that is working together regularly so that we're all, for lack of a better phrase, speaking the same language when it comes to what our data is and what our data is telling us so that when marketing goes off to market with something, the data scientists aren't like, what are you, huh? They're able to understand and know where we're coming from and what we're doing with the data. So it kind of helps everybody be on the same page, not only within the marketing org, but across our entire company. So I spend lots of time with our data engineers, our data scientists, our analysts. Um, and we have analysts on different teams. And so working across those teams as well is crucial to our day-to-day -day jobs to help move, whether it's an email program or a social program or really anything that we do forward. We have to have that data and we have to work with all the teams. We have a question over there. Hi, I'm uh, Laura Parker with PMG. Um, specifically for Libby, what are you guys doing as an organization to proactively communicate with your consumers about how you're leveraging the data? knowing that GDPR is in full effect and some of the legis legislative laws coming into effect in California. Like, are consumers, um, are you proactively telling them and allowing them to opt in uh, into future advertising? Or are you kind of keeping it as is for now? It's a great question. So Avo is US only. So that has put us in a unique spot compared to some of our or others in the space who are US and European and have to deal more directly with it. Um, and I know our legal team is, is all over making sure that we're doing the right things and disclosing in the, um, the ways that we need to. And I, I do think, not maybe to specifically answer your question, but a little bit, um, part of what we're trying to do is leverage the information that they're providing to us to help improve their experience with us, to help make legal easier. At the core of what AVO is trying to do is break down these very big walls of somebody has a legal problem and that is like a very personal, you hope it doesn't happen in your lifetime, but it can and does and you hope it doesn't happen more than once. And it's a very sometimes scary place to be. And so what we want to do is use the information they provide with us, to us to help make that process easier, to make legal easier for all of our consumers and for our attorneys as well. So breaking down those walls. And so part of what we use our data for is to help with that, to help when they ask a question. We have a very robust Q&A platform that's free to consumers to go on and ask questions and attorneys can respond. And using any information we have to help them move forward with that 
for lack of a better term, legal journey so that they get the answers they need, they feel empowered to make the decisions they need to so that in this very scary time they're able to move forward. And Libby is going to be leading the roundtable on this very topic at the end of the morning. Uh, Nina, panel, thanks very much for getting us off to a good start. We are, uh, we can't do these events without our, our sponsors, uh, but one of the things that's special about our sponsors, and I say this as somebody on the editor.